Our second lesson this morning is from the letters of Paul. It is the letter from Paul while he was in prison to his disciple Philemon, the entire letter. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God, because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful, both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him, as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. One thing more, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Well, I'm going to wager that most of you have not heard an entire letter of Paul's read aloud in worship, and that if you have, it wasn't the letter to Philemon. Hopefully, having just heard that letter, maybe for the very first time, you now have some questions like, Who was this Philemon? What was his relationship to Paul? Who was Onesimus? And why is Paul so determined to send him back to Philemon? And did we just hear a biblical passage on the day before we honor the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. about sending a slave back to his master? Well, the answer to the last question, at least, is yes. From what we now know, Philemon was a wealthy convert to Christianity. He heard the gospel from Paul, so they had a special relationship. Apparently, Philemon now hosts a group of other Christian converts, an early church of sorts, in his own house. Onesimus was Philemon's slave. Philemon's slave. 
And at that time in the first century, slavery was ubiquitous. It wasn't based on color, more often on class. But Onesimus was a slave who got to know the Apostle Paul while Paul was in prison. So Paul, in this letter, is writing to Philemon on Onesimus' behalf, begging Philemon not just to take back his slave, but to receive him back into his home in light of his newfound Christian faith. There are many reasons, some of which you could probably guess at based on Amy's introduction of the text, why this letter could be seen as problematic. One is the fact that Philemon was one biblical text misused to justify the enslavement of our African American ancestors. Christians, intent on upholding slavery, saw in this text Paul returning a runaway slave to his master. And that interpretation has cast a long shadow over this letter. New Testament scholar Eric Barreto argues that it's not enough to guess at what Paul might have meant as he wrote this letter in the first century. We must confront how Philemon has actually been read in our Christian communities and not that long ago. Our past is not just our past, Barreto says. It is our present and our future. The fact is, some of our sisters and brothers in Christ, in our not so distant past, read this letter as giving them permission to uphold racist systems. We have inherited that legacy. And that legacy is reason enough not to use Paul's letter to Philemon on a day when we would honor the life and work of Dr. King. So what are we to make of this letter? Do we have anything valuable to learn from this text? Well, having spent some time with this text now, Melanie and I would argue that yes, we do have something to learn from it. As difficult as it can be for us, given the sensitivity of these topics, given the current state of affairs in our country and our national discourse, we believe that this letter teaches us something we 21st century Christians desperately need to remember, that our faith, that this gospel is not just theoretical, it is eminently practical, relevant to the details of our everyday lives. It's not something we can just tune into on Sunday mornings when we come to church. This letter reminds us that our commitment to being Christ's disciples touches every aspect of our lives, not just within these walls, but also and especially outside them in the world. This text is an example of what it looks like when the rubber of the gospel hits the road. This is what Paul is saying to Philemon. If you are going to say you believe Christ, then you have to live like it. Although in certain historical moments, as Melanie mentioned, this letter was used to justify the return of runaway slaves to their masters, modern scholarship teaches us that it is not so likely that Onesimus was a runaway slave, but more likely that Philemon sent him to serve Paul in his imprisonment. While there, under the influence of Paul, the master evangelist for Christ, Onesimus heard and believed the gospel. He was transformed. But in the process, Paul was transformed too. Because although he is also a product of his culture where fully one-third of the population was enslaved, Paul can no longer see Onesimus as simply Philemon's slave. Onesimus has been, as Paul writes, reborn. And this rebirth affected Paul as much as Onesimus himself. He likens their relationship more now to the relationship of family members, 
So Paul is writing this letter to compel Philemon and his whole community to receive Onesimus back among them in the same way, no longer as a cog in the wheel of the household economy, but as a brother in Christ, which is to say, as an equal. Paul invites Philemon and the Christian community with him to a radical reorientation of their understanding of Onesimus' identity. Imagine, Paul writes, that when he walks through the door, you are welcoming me home. Like the Apostle Paul, Martin Luther King Jr. had incredible rhetorical skills, and he used them to invite his fellow citizens and his fellow Christians to a radical reorientation of what it means to follow Christ, to live as though every encounter we have with another human being, regardless of any way they are different from us, is actually an encounter with Christ. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. King offers a scathing, if gracious, critique of the mainline Southern Church. He writes, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leadership of this community would see the justice of our cause and with deep moral concern serve as the channel through which our just grievances could get to the power structure. Instead, King goes on to write, in the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churches stand on the sidelines and merely mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of radical and racial and economic injustice, I have heard so many ministers say, those are social concerns which the gospel has nothing to do with. And I have watched so many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which made a strange distinction between bodies and souls, the sacred and the secular. Like Paul, Dr. King claimed that the gospel makes no distinction between bodies and souls, the sacred and the secular. King also, in that letter, reminded his readers that the early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Martin Luther King Jr. was what we often call in ministry a rising star. He was a young and dynamic preacher with obvious leadership potential who showed every sign of, being, of having a far-reaching and successful career in ministry ahead of him, a future he had been groomed for his entire life. Dr. King was part of a family dynasty of preachers going back to the turn of the 20th century. He had been given every privilege of education and upbringing his family could afford. Graduating from Morehouse College at the age of 19, he was elected president of his seminary class just three years later and completed his doctorate by the time he was just 26 years old. He was on the executive committee of the NAACP. He was president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He had a wife and four children. When he took a leadership role in the civil rights movement, he had everything to lose. He could have easily said no when the call came, as it did many times, asking him to use the power and standing he had to help better the lives of those who were suffering around him. He could have easily said no. But like Christ and like Paul, Dr. King counted the cost of discipleship and knew that all that he had meant nothing if he was not willing to use it to bring about God's justice in this world. In other words, although King made significant demands on others to sacrifice for the movement, 
He wasn't asking anyone to do what he wasn't willing to do himself. He was willing to give up by what all evidence showed to be a long and illustrious career. He was willing to give up a life of relative comfort as a respected member of an elite class within the African-American community. He was willing to give up his own safety and freedom. He was willing to give up his life. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, he wasn't asking white religious leaders to do the work for him. He was calling them to join with him, to use their standing in the community to stand with him, whatever the cost. Joy DeGray is a black woman who is part of a multicultural, multiracial family. Her sister-in-law, Kathleen, is half black and half white, but she looks white. In fact, Joy says she has blue eyes and looks whiter than most white folks. They lived near each other and raised their children together. One day, they went into a Safeway to pick up some groceries. Kathleen checked out first, and the young, white, freckled cashier engaged her in upbeat conversation about the beautiful weather. Kathleen wrote a check to pay for her groceries, and then it was Joy's turn. When the cashier looked up and saw Joy and her 10-year-old daughter standing next to her, she stopped talking. No conversation at all as Joy checked out her groceries and then wrote a check for her groceries, as her sister had done. Then the cashier spoke, saying, I'm going to need to see two pieces of ID. She had asked Kathleen for no ID. Joy looked at her daughter, who was growing more distraught and embarrassed by the second, and then she looked at the two elderly white ladies in line behind her, Joy knew that if she protested, she was going to become the angry black woman and stir up all kinds of drama. So she handed over the ID. But when the cashier took, but that's when the cashier took out the bad check book. It's the book the store kept of the names of all the people who have written bad checks to the store. She was clearly looking for Joy's name on the list. That's when Kathleen, who had been waiting for Joy off to the side, stepped back in. Excuse me, she said to the cashier, why are you doing this? Why are you putting her through this? And the cashier said, well, this is our policy. Kathleen responded, no, it's not, because you didn't do that to me. Well, but I know you, the cashier said. You've been here for years. No. Kathleen replied, she's been here for years. I've shopped here for a few months. And then that's when the two elderly ladies behind Joy took up Joy's cause. We can't believe what is happening here, they said. What's being done to this woman is totally unacceptable. At which point, the manager walks over. Is there a problem here? they said. Kathleen said, yes, there is a problem here. And she explained what had happened. In this situation, though she was half black and half white, Kathleen knew that her appearance of being white conferred upon her privilege. And so she used that privilege to intervene and stop an injustice. And as a result, she influenced everyone in that space. She used her power and privilege to make right a situation that was wrong. That is the power Paul uses when he writes this letter to Philemon, a letter that compels this wealthy, respected, privileged man to receive Onesimus home, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. And Paul isn't asking Philemon to do anything he hasn't done. Paul makes this demand of Philemon because of who Paul is within the early church. He uses his power to act on behalf of a slave. He uses his privilege to elevate the status of one who is oppressed. And he calls Philemon and the church to do the same. Turns out, this ancient letter is a text all about 
power, privilege, and how you use it. Privilege is not something that we choose. We may not even want it. But once we recognize the privilege that we do have, the question becomes, how far are we really willing to go to live out the justice of the gospel? How can we use the power or privilege that we do have to lift up those around us who have been beaten down by injustice or oppression? We could all work to improve our public schools, not just the schools our own children attend, but all the schools in our community so that everyone may get a quality education. Or just imagine how great could public transportation be for everyone if wealthy people who didn't need it used it and made demands for its improvement? I bet we could pretty quickly diminish the effects of harassment in the workplace if we stood by those who chose to speak out against a powerful abuser and made sure that abusers are held accountable for their behavior. And you know, we teach our children to speak up against bullying, to not be passive bystanders when they see someone being mistreated. I wonder, are we willing to do the same thing? There are neighborhoods in our community where it is not safe for children to walk alone to school. What if we showed up there and walked with them to make sure they arrive at school safely every day? How might it change the outcome if you or I, when we saw a police officer pull over a driver of color, just stopped and stood there as a neutral witness to their encounter? We could consider giving up our seats on boards or even our scholarships so that someone from an underrepresented group could take our place. These are just some ideas. There are endless others. But the only way our world will start to look more like the world Jesus envisioned and the world Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed about is if each one of us is willing to let our faith transform not just our thinking, but the way we see and treat others, especially those who seem different. It will require those of us with power and privilege conferred on us for no better reason than what we look like, where we were born, or what we have to call out and fight against the injustice visited on our brothers and sisters who happen to be born into different circumstances. And it will require those of us who have experienced injustice to see ourselves simply and truly for what we are, beloved daughters and sons of God. It will require us to radically love and honor ourselves in the face of other people's fear and discomfort celebrating our worth, claiming our power, and standing boldly in our identity as essential members of the body of Christ. Above all, it will require us to trust in God, believing that the Spirit of God can move and does move to transform the lives of the privileged and of the oppressed. Through his own radical transformation, by which he became a follower of Jesus, the Apostle Paul, through that transformation, Paul learned, as he wrote in another letter, that there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, that we are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul knew and preached that we all have power and privilege because every one of us is God's beloved child, and that to speak or act as if some people are inherently better than others is a lie. Paul knew that our faith demands that we use whatever power and privilege we have to disrupt injustice and oppression whenever and wherever we see it. Every year at this time, we pause to reflect on where we are as a country in relation to Dr. King's dream.
and it can be hard not to fall into despair. When we see a week in our national news like the week we just saw, when we think about the weeks and the weeks and the months and the years and the centuries that nonsense has gone on in this country, and we wonder if and when ever that might change and how on earth we might be able to help it change. Yet perhaps the greatest act of nonviolent resistance we can engage in is to act out there like what we proclaim in here actually matters and is true that every person has inherent equal worth in God's eyes, no matter what country they come from, no matter the color of their skin, no matter their education or their income. We are all children of the living God, sisters and brothers of Jesus Christ. May we use our power and privilege to create a world defined by this truth seeking justice and equity, working for love and peace. Amen. Amen.